All right, so now we're going to jump into Production Manager, which is, which is the, our RIP. Um, so if, if you ever wondered what RIP stands for, it, it uh, stands for Raster Image Processing. So basically what a RIP does is it takes vector and raster images and converts them to raster and then in a language that the printer knows how to print. Um, and then I think what everybody's interested in col is color management. I, I can give you a bunch of tips. Um, color management is, I think, the hardest thing to deal with because every file is different um, and it can be... It, it can be really frustrating. You can have images that have rasters in them, that have uh, vectors and spot colors, RGB colors, CMY colors. So there's some kind of tips to help you um, manage things. And if you, if you understand how everything works, I think it makes it a lot easier. Um, there's a great tool in Flexi for like uh, matching specific colors. So like Pantone colors, spot colors. Um, so we'll go over that. It's a really cool tool. It'll make your life really easy. Um, and then when you get into rasters like photographs and stuff like that, there's some just some tricks to know. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in the RIP that are like time-saving production type features that we'll go over first um, that I really like to go over and like I said can help save you some time. So we'll go over those and then we'll jump into color management and I'm sure we'll have a good discussion with that. So I, I wish I could like give you the, the tools to match everything perfect, but like I said, I think understanding how everything works makes it a lot easier. Um, there's a couple things that we won't go over. Um, unless, uh, so you're from Cinerama? Correct. Okay, hey, my name is Jason, I'm with Flexi Software. Awesome. I've been in the industry for 25 years. I owned, my family owned a Cinerama store. Um, we used to be downtown, it went through a couple of hands and is no longer around. Um, so are you, are you the owner, do you work for Cinerama? I, I'm a designer. Oh, okay, <clears throat> which store? The Sandy store. The Sandy store, oh, okay. So uh, just off of I-15? Correct, yeah, oh, 8500. Yeah, 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 okay, very cool. Um, do you guys have, do you guys have a flatbed UV? We do, we just got it. Okay, Yeah. Well, what did you get? Um, it's a Vanguard VK300. Yeah, okay, very cool. We'll have drivers for that printer shortly. Awesome. Um, so actually I will, um, we have one feature, it's a jig template tool. And I'll, I'll show just because I, I love showing the feature, but it, it'd be helpful for you. And then, uh, you know, uh, when we get that driver, if Flexi makes sense running it for you, then uh, that would be cool. So, um, and then you don't have a, do you have a print, do you have an HP that prints white? No. Okay, so we won't go over that. I don't think anybody needs to go over that workflow at all, dude. Nobody has a printer with white. Okay. All right. So. We will go into some production features and then we'll get into color management. Um, so we'll go over nesting first. Does anybody currently do nesting with Flexi while they're printing? No? Okay. So this is, do you? Do you what does that mean, how you do? <laughs> okay. So there's some really Stickers. cool features. Yeah, we'll go over it. Uh, the, this, could, this is really helpful. We'll go over nesting and tiling. Um, so nesting is super easy. Um, I've got several different printers loaded here, uh, cutters. Um, we'll go through print and cut workflow as well. Uh, but nesting is pretty cool. Um, and kind of getting into color management a little bit. Every program that you work with has a color space. And we want to avoid putting files into different color spaces because changes can happen. So. Um, you want to minimize how many programs you open files into. If you get a file that's ready to go, it's always best to open it directly into um, Production Manager and print from there. Because if you open a file into Flexi and then hit print from here, it goes through Color Management. And when you open it into Flexi, it goes through Color Management. And then when you send it to Production Manager, it goes through Color Management again. So there's too many chances for things to get uh, mixed up there. So if you have a file um, and you can open it into Production Manager, that's always the best thing to do. 
Um, I, I know a lot of people will open a file, put a cut line in Flexi, and then send it to Production Manager. And we actually, um, well, I'll show you this too really quick. We added the ability to create cut lines right in Production Manager, so you don't have to necessarily do it in uh, um, Flexi. So actually, I'll show you, I'll, we'll, we'll show you that first before we jump into nesting. If I have a job, let's see here. I'm going to go into a different directory here. This is a new feature in 22 that's really cool. I'm a big Ute fan, so we're gonna pull out the Ute logo here. So uh, this is just a, a print file. It has no cut line or anything here. Um, we added this new feature in Flexi. It's this tab right here. So I just opened the job and uh, double clicked on it. This is our transparency tab. We can generate white in here. Um, but a cool feature that we added in here is, uh, do you remember in design where we created the transparent background and put the cut line around it? We can actually do that in Production Manager now. So under this tab, we click on this button, and if I hold the Shift key down on these white areas, um, it creates a transparent background. So if we had a white printer, we could then tell we want to print white underneath this. Uh, so it makes it super easy there. You don't have to do layers, but we added this button right here so I can create contour cut paths right in Production Manager. So I could then put this quarter of an inch away and do everything right there in Production Manager. Is this feature only available in 22? Only in 22. And it's really, it, we did this for the white HP printer, because uh, this it's really more about generating the transparent background to create the white. Sure. But I uh, added this feature in there, so that, that's kind of a cool feature. So. I wanted to show that because if you have a file and you open it right into Production Manager, you can do the cut line here to avoid uh, going through multiple things of color management. So the other, the, so we'll, we'll go over nesting here. Um, so nesting is just taking like five files um, and printing them all on like media. So there's multiple ways to open files into Production Manager. You can go to Job and Add Job here. You can click on the printer tab here and add a job, or you can actually drag and drop jobs on here too. What you would do is you'd select your printer and then drop it into the queue. But we're going to go here to add job. We are going to go to all my files here. So I've just got five files I created on here. Um, and what we could do, there's a couple things you can do. You could, uh, if we wanted to add all five of these, you could hit Control A. You could hold the Shift key down and select the top one and the bottom one. Or you can hold the Control key and we could open these three files. So that's kind of handy. A lot of people don't know about that. Um, and there's a couple ways we can nest files. I'm going to show you, um, we're going to open all these individually. But when you do this, there's a button right here where you can actually nest these jobs. So you can open these five and automatically nest it. Um, that's the easiest way, but we're going to open them all individually into Production Manager here. So those are my five jobs. And then what we can do is we can select, I hold the Shift key down and I select all of these, and then we just hit the Nest button. So really easy, so then it, well, actually, you know what, I'm going to unnest this. I always forget, this is a new feature that we just added. So I'm going to nest these four jobs. So we've got these jobs, and if I double click on it now, it nests them all together here. So then we can come down here, and this is our spacing. So if we wanted half an inch spacing between these, I can put that in here. And that puts my half inch spacing in here. A cool thing about Flexi is that we have a live preview for nesting. So I've got my job here now. I've got my media in here. Um, and when you do this, you always want to pull size and make sure it's uh, the correct media size on there. Because if you have 64 in here, 
but you have 54 inch media in the material, it's going to mess up your nest. The HPs automatically populate the, the size in there. Um, others, you have to hit the pull size. <coughs> um, but this is a live nest. So now that we've got my jobs in here, I can select each individual job. And then I could say, this job, I want to print three of these. So that's going to put them in there. And then I want four of this job. And then maybe we need ten of these. And then we're going to come back here to this last job. And maybe we're just going to kind of fill in here. So you can just kind of add jobs on there. So once we've got everything nested on there, um, you can go ahead and print this. Um, or you can come down here if you don't like the way these are done. You can select this button right here that says manual nesting. And then I can grab each individual job and move it to where I want to on there. So nesting is a pretty cool feature. Um, so if I hit OK on here, um, and then I wanted to add more jobs to this nest, I can bring them into Production Manager, and then this job right here, if I want to add it to the nest, I can just grip, drag and drop it. And it says, do you want to move job into nest job? So we hit yes, it adds it in there, and there's my job right there. So then I could come in here and I could tell it however many copies I wanted to do of that. So that is nesting in um, Production Manager. Pretty easy. We also have, I haven't done this one in a little bit, this will be kind of fun. We have um, another nesting feature in the design side of Flexi. So if you do it in Production Manager, it, it doesn't create as big of a job. So in, uh, if we do it in design, um, we can actually, in Production Manager, it only puts them at like 90 degrees. So you can't rotate and puzzle piece everything in together. In the design, we can actually do that. So what I do is I create like a, we're going to say like a 4 by 8 foot sheet. And we're going to create a stop sign. sign is eight sides. I'm not going to put stop in here. I'm just going to do our, our if we go into um, arrange and true shape nesting, this is where it's going to rotate it and puzzle piece everything together. So, um, so we're going to come in here to arrange, true shape nest, and then production manager is everything here. So we can put whatever size sheet we wanted in here. If we wanted like a 54 inch uh, for our media and however wide our spacing kind of tolerance on here, um, our rotation tolerance, and then our copies on here. So if I come in here and put like 20 copies. I can redraw and it, it kind of, it, it puzzle pieces everything together on there. So then we could come in here, we could just utilize this uh, as much as we wanted. And it just kind of puzzle pieces everything together on there. What uh, was that called? Sorry. The it's called uh, True Shape Nesting. So it's under Arrange and True Shape Nesting. So I did a really simple example of it. So you can actually create a, uh, a job with um, contour cuts and everything on there. And then you could have three or four different jobs in there and you can use this tool to do that. So if, you, if you're perf cutting, this could be a useful tool because it could really save you media. But a lot of times you're cutting uh, squares and rectangles of things. So, so this could be a useful tool. Um, or maybe not, but it's, it's another way of nesting things. So one, true shape nesting is in the design, and then nesting itself is in production manager. So kind of two different ways to do that. Um, 
So then we'll go, up, we'll, we'll go over tiling a little bit for you guys that do vehicle wraps. Because um, you said you're tiling everything in Illustrator and then bringing those individual pieces in. So I'm going to open a, a larger job here. this example for our banner finishing tab and our um, nesting here. We added a new thing in Flexi that I'm not sure I like 100% yet. I'm sure there's a, well, it, it, it's good. I, I can see the value of it, but when I'm doing demos and stuff, it drives me a little crazy. My printer right here, if I right click on it and go to Setup Properties, we added this button right here, rotate image to fit media. So you'll, it, it comes automatically clicked on there. So you'll see that when I open a banner, this is a three foot by 10 foot banner. It automatically rotates it to go the length of the, the print, which makes sense on there. So all we're gonna do is uh, rotate it. And then Flexi automatically tiles for you. Um, so um, our tile tab is right here. So this was, what size was it? Yeah, three foot by 10 foot banner here. Um, well, it's a banner. We're gonna say it's a vehicle graphics. We're not gonna tile a banner. So if something's larger than the media, it automatically tiles it for you. Our tile tab is right here. So if we click on that, this is where we can manage our tiles. So it automatically tiles it to fit the media. But if you wanted to um, add more tiles, say you wanted three tiles on here, you could do that. So I just click the button here, and I could put horizontal tiles as well on here. Um, if you do this, and then unclick these, if I select this first tile, so now if, if we do multiple tiles like this, we can specify these, we can let Flexi do it, or we can specify sizes on these. So I can grab any of these tiles and move them anywhere I want to on here. And the other thing that you can do is when I select these tiles, it's going to do the size right here. So this is tile one. If I needed this to be 30 inches by 12 inches, I could specify that on here. So you can go through and specify each tile size on there. Um, and then this is your overlap. What's a typical overlap on a vehicle graphic? Is it half inch? I usually run half inch. Half inch. So you can come in here and put that half inch on there. And that's going to be your over, overlap on there. And I, I've done a little bit of this. I don't remember he has to. It, it spaces them. Like on the print, we'll put a space between them. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you can just cut it easier? I mean, so just what we do, the way I'm looking at it is you're just going to print that. What is the tiling? So the purpose of this tiling would be, for example, you're doing a building and it's got different windows on there and you want to specifically like this. Like you wouldn't break up a vehicle graphic into multiple tiles like this. What you're, what you're probably going to do is just, I'm going to reopen this. Kind of more like for media, that's a job that's bigger than the media. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like you're doing building windows or something where you need that, those tiles to be an exact specific size on there. So most of the time people are tiling. It's going to be something real um, simple like this. You're going to, um, actually we're going to do this. We're going to make this good. Um, and, and I did that specifically for a reason here, I'll show you in a second. But you're going to come in here, um, you've got three tiles on here, and uh, um, you would move it, for example, maybe um, the tile you don't want, like in the middle of the eye there. So maybe you're going to move the tile in between two letters so that it lines up and the seam doesn't have to be exactly on there. Um, the only reason you, I showed this other tile is just because we have it in case you 
have to specify on there. So the other nice thing about tiles then is that, let's see if I can thread it, mess this up here. Um, with this page, if you, uh, if you printed this and then you messed up one of the tiles and you need to go back and reprint one, you can come in here and you can right click and uh, just print this tile on here. So if I right click and grade out, it's not going to print this tile. And there's actually another way that you could do this that I like a little bit better, but this option is available. Um, the other thing that we added, and I'm curious if this has ever happened to you guys with, um, with vehicle wraps, but we heard from a lot of people that somebody will make a, a, a vehicle graphic or a tile, and they'll bring it into the rip, they'll, they'll do it in the tiles. And I, my vision's not the best, but there's a third tile right here that's really tiny. So we heard from a lot of vehicle wrap guys that they would set up their tiles and then they'd hit the printer to print at night so they could come back in the morning and laminate it and go. Uh, but they would have like IJ180C in there and they only thought it was two tiles, but it ended up printing three, and the third tile was half an inch. So you wasted uh, five feet of IJ180. So we actually, um, this is a cool new feature in Flexi. If we went to send this, oops. I didn't save it, so one twenty-eight and a quarter. So we've got that third tile here. If I hit OK on here, when I go to uh, send this, I might not have set it up. I may have done my math wrong, but um, under edit and preferences, we set up this new uh, feature on here. It's called. Um, It's a small tile. Is that is it only a 22? Yeah. Oh, right here. Display warnings for smart small tiles. So you can set the threshold. So if you, uh, I've got it set at one inch. So if it ever tiles anything and it's under one inch for the tile, it'll come up with a warning and say there's a small tile there. Do you want to continue printing? And that way you could go back and look and say, oh, you know what? I don't want that small tile. Um, so then you can go in and grade out so it doesn't print or size it down so it doesn't have that on there. I think I didn't see it because I had the half inch overlap. So my half inch turned into like 1.2 inches there. But that's kind of a new feature. Have you guys ever had that happen where you printed that small tile? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of... It was only 20 feet, so it was all good. Oh, just <laughs> 20 feet. <laughs> so here's the other way I like to tile it. So Say we have the same thing here. Um, we're going to add the same job. And what we're going to do, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do the tiles here. We're going to go 120. Oops. So I've got my three tiles there now. We're going to hit OK, and then what we're going to do this time is we're going to right click on it, and then we can actually break this tile job apart. So if I hit break apart, it says this function can't be undone, I'm going to hit yes, and it breaks it into three individual jobs. So if I wanted to, I could hit unnest here, so then I've got my one tile, my second tile, and I've got my small tile here. So then, you know, I could delete this one, and then I could print these two individually there. Or, um, oops, I shouldn't have deleted that. So what we could have done is I could have left it as a nest, and then it had that small tile, and then maybe I see that, and maybe I want to add um, my, uh, my, I have maybe little stickers that I put on everything, so then you could add that into that nest and uh, not waste all that media on there. So that break apart is kind of a new function that we added into Flexi 22. Does that make sense on nesting and tiling? Yeah. 
So another thing I wanted to show here, we're going to have the same job, but we're going to do a, we'll say it's a banner this time. I love this tool. So we open this up and we're going to print this as a banner. We have our banner finishing tool, which is this tool right here. If I select on this, then I've got different options on here. So this is a three foot by 10 foot banner. Um, the first option is grommets. So if I wanted to place grommets every, um, you can do it by number or by distance on here. So if I wanted to do them every 12 inches, um, we could do that. And then uh, along the side, um, maybe we're going to do three foot uh, every, we'll do every 12 inches as well on there. I know it's kind of hard to see, but if we uh, zoom in here, you can see that it puts in these grommet marks for you. Um, and you can change the size of those. You can make them solid if you wanted to do a different color. You can do that. Well, yellow's probably not going to be good. Maybe green. You can change them to green on there. You can change circle. You can do rectangles on there. I don't know why you want to do that. But then you can change the diameter of the circle on there. So that makes it easy to put grommet marks. The offset up here means that it's going to do one inch from the top side and bottom. So there's going to be one inch from here to here and one inch from there to there. So you can change that to two inches, whatever you want to do your grommets at. The other options that we have here are fold lines. So we can create a fold line. So if we're doing a one inch hem on here, I can type in one and if I hit this button, it fills one inch all the way around. So now it's going to put uh, a one inch hemline around it. Um, so we do have to, we have two options here. If I select frame, it's going to print a black mark so you know where to trim it. And then if I do stitch, it's going to put a stitched line right on the edge so you won't know where to fold it there. Um, with this banner, um, maybe we want to bleed this so that when we fold it over, um, it, it maybe looks a little more pleasing, so we can bleed this. Um, and there's several options on here. We can repeat, which basically takes the last pixel there and just repeats it. Or if you do mirror, it takes that one inch down and mirrors it. Um, this is good for canvas as well. Um, and then if you click on no corners, um, to me it seems opposite if I click no corners there. Oh, well, no, if I do that, then it does no corners, so it makes sense. If I unclick it, it fills in the corner there. So a way to add bleeds and trim and fold marks on there, um, kind of a neat feature in Flexi. And there is another cool feature I just thought of that um, I've been waiting for somebody to try this out. I don't know if it would work or not. But on this tab right here where I showed you where we could do our contour cut marks, this is made for generating white in files, but it has a cool feature. It's actually meant for DTF <coughs> and DTG, so printing t-shirts. Um, and there's a new process out where you print ink and then you transfer it over. But if you have a big transfer that's like 12 inches by 12 inches, you're going to put on the back of a shirt. It's a heavy print and it's not breathable. So you can actually put holes in it. Um, I'll show you. No, yeah, this will work. Um, so if we come in here, it's called Remove Data in Texture Patterns. I'm going to bring up a different file. And I'm curious if you guys think that this might actually work or not. I think it's just easier to view on a smaller file. So if we come here, we can add this data in a textured pattern. So we can go to circles here, and it's actually, um, it's not going to print circles on here. So this is for uh, textile printing, but I started thinking that if you ever wanted to print your own window perf instead of buying your expensive window perf or doing something there, this might be a a viable option, although you'd still, ink is kind of translucent, so you might uh, lose something there. 
a kind of a cool feature meant for one thing, but I think might have another application out there. So you can do circles, you can change the dimension of the circles, the spacing of it, you can change, and then kind of the offset pattern on it on there. So kind of a cool feature I like to throw out there and see if somebody can come up with a, a different um, application for it than what it's actually meant for. Would you just print that on a clear if you were doing yeah. it in lieu? Okay. So you have to cut out all the circles. Or yeah, so I, I don't know if it would necessarily work for like a latex or a, a muto, but if you had a flatbed printer like the Vanguard, and then uh, you could print white underneath it and then print the image on top of it, like you could put it on plexiglass and kind of create your own window perf type thing. Or if you had a printer with white, you could print on a clear film put the white under it, and then the color on it. Because if you just print, um, I don't know if you guys have, you guys ever tried to print on clear film, and then you peel it off and you see through it, and you can't really see the image. Yeah, well. So if you could put white under it, um, this could have an application for something like that. Does it print the circles? It doesn't print. So, so basically it, uh, it knocks out it the, where it's going to print with the circle. So that's a new feature we threw in there. So I'm going to show one more feature for our Sinorama guy back there with the, the Vanguard. This feature is pretty cool. So um, these flatbed UV printers, a lot of times they're printing, like the small one that I showed you earlier, um, you can print on iPhone covers, golf balls. So what you're going to do is you're going to lay down like 12 iPhone covers and print on them. <coughs> So um, Flexi, we have a, a jig template that you can set up. Um, so if we go into our default properties, and I'll go through this kind of quick here. Um, down here we have this jig template. And what you do is you define your template. And so I already kind of did this iPhone 1. Um, iPhone 14s are apparently 2.8 inches by 5.8. So you define your bed size here. And then your jig size and then your spacing on here. So this creates uh, a jig where you can then put uh, 12 iPhones down and your printer's gonna print on it. So we've defined this jig template. And there's a couple things you can do. You could actually, you could put mask on the bed, print this outline, and then you just lay your iPhone covers on there and it'll print on them. Or you could export this and have somebody route out uh, a plastic jig that you then put on there that your golf balls or whatnot fit on there. But then what you do is you come in here and we're going to add jobs. So we're going to add a bunch of jobs. So this example, we're printing iPhone covers and we're going to put um, we're going to put different dogs on here. Hopefully. My computer's not liking me. You always go through these uh, demonstrations and then uh, they don't go as smoothly as you practiced the night before. So I've got all these here. I thought there were more than that. But what we do is we go in here and we nest these. And then on here, we go to apply jig. And it takes all those jobs and it puts it on all those individual uh, spots there. So now I could send this over and lay down my iPhone covers on there. And it's going to print all those for us. Kind of a cool feature. Do you guys... Uh, are you guys putting like yard signs and stuff with your yeah. Vanguard? Yeah. So you could do the same thing. You could set up HP by 24s and then you could uh, import all these jobs in there and just do, do that. So I might reach out to you guys once we get our driver for that Vanguard and uh, come over and work with you if you'd be interested. That would be awesome. Okay. So now we'll get into color matching. So this is the fun stuff here. Um, the first thing that we want to talk about is you've heard me talk about color spaces. Um, 
this is probably the most been important thing you can do. So when you um, when you're working in Illustrator or Corel Draw or Flexi, you set up a color space, and the easiest way to think about it is um, there's all these different color spaces, and it's how color is displayed. And the hard part about large format printing is our monitors are RGB, and so they emit light and combine to get colors. And I believe RGB, like if you um, if you put emit light, uh, all the colors of the spectrum you get white. Whereas you go to CMYK printing, and if you add all the colors together, you get black. So they're complete opposites there. So RGB has that well. Um, our monitors have a color space that's got millions upon millions of colors. And then you get a large format printer, and the inks that are in there have pigment in them, and because of the size of that pigment, your color gamut is a lot smaller. So you can think about it as your monitor has a color gamut the size of a basketball, and then your printer has a color gamut the size of a softball. And so then the hard part is, what do we do with those colors that we've designed that are not in the color gamut of our printer. And this is where colors don't come out like they're supposed to. So the first thing that we want to do is set up our programs and what we're seeing um, match. Because if, uh, if, if you have somebody who's working in Illustrator and they have their color settings set at this, but then you open it into Flexi and your color settings don't match, they're going to be completely different. You're not going to be seeing what they saw on there. Uh, one way I saw an analogy last night as I was kind of looking through some stuff that really kind of helped me make sense of it. It's like imagine if uh, the person that gave you the file is designing an illustrator um, and then uh, they're designing, um, well they're not designing an illustrator, but they are designing with a box of crayons that's 64 different colors in there. So they've got all these options on there, but then you try and create that same design, but you've only got a box of eight crayons. So there's no way, so when they go to pick red, they've got like eight choices of red, but you've maybe only got one choice of red. So what a brick does is we try and match that color space. And it's called an input profile. So if we go into production manager here, and right click and go to default job properties. This third tab is our color management tab. And um, this advanced tab right here, these, this is our color management tab here. So if you take one thing away from this training, uh, the, this color management training, is to always make sure that you have use embedded ICC profiles clicked on here. Um, in 22, we have CMYK, RGB, and gray. I believe in 21 and older, there's just one box that says it use embedded ICC profile. So what this means is that um, whenever we import a file, it's going to use that embedded color space that the original designer did. Because if we didn't click this, we're going to take their artwork and use our color settings, and those are going to change colors here. So this is different than a profile. So if we um, say we're printing on IJ180C, we could use that profile, but if we brought up the same file and printed it with three different input settings, you're going to get three different colors of that file. And it's not the profile, it's that initial color space that was used. Um, a lot of times people don't embed their, their color space, which is good because then you can use the defaults here. And uh, these, are, these are defaults that you want set on here. For CMYK, uh, this Grackle 2006 coded. For RGB, it's sRGB. And then gray is Grackle. So these are defaults in Flexi. Um, but if you have these selected, it's going to use the color space that it was designed in. Does that make sense? Um, so you can actually, um, if you go into Illustrator, um, I don't know exactly where it is, 
but you can go in there to your color settings and you're going to see those exact same input profiles. So if you go into uh, Illustrator, you'll see that there's uh, input profiles for, uh, well, there'll be profiles for CMYK, RGB, and gray. And then it's the same with Flexi. So if we are designing in Flexi, if we go to Edit and Color Settings, these are our settings here. Um, so if we um, so if we didn't use that embedded ICC profile and uh, we printed on the same IJ180 profile, but we printed the file with RGB and then we printed it with swap and something else, you're going to get those different colors. So the most important thing is use embedded profiles so that our color spaces are the same. So that's the first thing. Um, so if, we, if you use Flexi, there's a, the, there's a pretty cool tool in here called Softproof that is really helpful. So if I open this file here. So we've got these two colors here. Um, we can go in here to Flexi, we go to our color settings, um, and we're going to do what's called a soft proof. And I, I kind of wish we set this as a default rather than having to turn it on, but you'll kind of see why here. So what we're going to do is, uh, under your monitor, you can actually profile your monitor. Does, does anybody here have a spectrometer? Has anybody ever created their own profiles? I wish we did. Yeah, so a spectrometer, it's a device that reads color. So you put it on color, it'll give you a, an LAB value, a CMYK value, or an RGB value. And you can actually um, calibrate your monitor. But we, um, monitors are a lot better than they used to be. So you can come in here and just select generic LCD monitor profile. And then we're going to select our printer. So I'm going to select my HP... Um, my, F, uh, my 800W, and then you can pick your profile. So um, I've only got, I'm not connected to a printer, so I've only got a few profiles loaded. So I'm going to use, I'm going to select just this uh, generic cast adhesive vinyl profile, and then hit OK. And then if I set that color setting to what I'm going to print on, there's a button right up here called soft proof and this is going to emulate my printer's color gamut so this is going to give you an idea what it's going to print out before you actually print it so you can see that the red doesn't change very much but the blue does when I do it on there and if you have a, a color that's out of gamut you're going to see right away that it's going to print quite a bit different I think usually like lime green which is not a color you print a lot of. I believe this one will change quite a bit here when we go to soft proof. Yeah, that green changes. It goes from a lime green to kind of like a dark green. So um, this soft proof, if you set up those color settings and then click on the soft proof, it's going to emulate your printer's color gamut based on that profile that you selected. And this is going to give you an idea first that something's not maybe going to, it's going to print more like what it looks on the screen if you do that soft proof on there. Does that make sense? So this soft proof is a very valuable tool on here for color management. So the other thing um, then is, does Flex C have uh, license with Pantones, all Pantones? Library? Yes. Yes. So, so that, that that's going to get into something a little bit different. So Pantones are spot colors. Mm -hmm. um, so RGB and CMYK are a little, a little different. Spot. Maybe if you really need to match a color, we're going to go over spot color mapping. And so um, Pantones are, are pretty cool. 
because we have a library built into the rip of Flexi. So we know the, um, the values of those colors in there. So if we, um, if we create artwork with spot colors named a certain thing, so the, a spot color, the rip reads the name and not like the value of it. So you could have represented on the screen um, Pantone red, but it would, you could actually have it blue in color, but it's going to recognize the name 45C and the rip's going to go, I know I need to print it like this. Um, and so, yeah, so we have those, we have, a, um, we have that in, built in the rip, those values in there. Does it update? Yes. So yeah, we we spend a lot of money to do that licensing. Pantone's got the market on that, and I believe Adobe and Pantone just like uh, separate parted ways, and Adobe no longer works with Pantone. You have to buy special license. If oh, really? you want to get the extra colors, you can do a subscription. Oh. And get it, but they don't just offer. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you do that through Pantone or through Adobe? Through, well, just through Pantone. Uh, well, I don't know. You go through Adobe. Okay. Whatever they have. Okay. It's some kind of subscription. Right? Yeah. I, our company, we adopted subscription years ago. There's a lot of good things about it, but I think it's getting a little crazy lately, too. I heard that... Uh, Cars now, you can buy like a subscription for heated seats, like your car <laughs> has heated seats in it, but you have to actually, like BMW in that, you have to actually pay like a yearly fee to use that feature on there, so. People can hack into it though. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we, our, our software gets hacked uh, too. That's a big thing that we find. So, um, so yeah, so, so it's really important to set up those color spaces so that we're we're all on the same page. Those embedded profiles are really important. Um, and then uh, um, we'll go into spot color mapping here. Uh, we'll, we'll go over some other things before we go in that. So um, other things that are involved in this. So when we go to default job properties, uh, you know what, let's go through this first. Does, you, do you, does anybody understand I know we talk about profiles all the time, and when they set up your printer, they always say use the right profile. Do you do you guys know what a profile is and how they're made? Kind of. Um, profiles are pretty interesting. So every printer um, ink the cyan's a little bit different. So HP cyan compared to Muto cyan compared to Roland cyan, they're going to have a little different formula. So a profile takes all those colors and mathematically knows how to mix those proportions of those colors to get the proper color. Um, so within Flexi, you can create your own profiles. If you really are into color management, you can get a color spectrometer. They range anywhere from like 500 to several thousand dollars. And it's a device that just read colors. So there's a couple of cool things. With those, you can generate your own profiles and manage your color really well. The other thing that you can do is you can use those spectrometers and somebody brings you in a swatch, you can actually read that color and then bring it into the rip and be able to match that color. Um, so spectrometers are, are really good devices to create a profile. Um, we have a wizard. So if we right click on here, I'm just going to kind of show you to help you kind of understand what a profile is. So we come in here and uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna create a profile. So if we click on here, there's a bunch of different steps on here. You're gonna set your printer, your ink set, uh, your resolution, and everything here. And then we're gonna go to next. Um, so the first thing that you do is you set up ink limits. In what you do is you print your, your CMYK values, your light cyan and light magenta. And what these are is it sets a limit on how much ink your media absorbs. Um, so like if you've ever printed on gloss media with a matte profile, 
A matte profile puts down a lot more ink because the ink absorbs into a matte finish, whereas gloss it doesn't. So the first thing you do on a profile is you set up how much ink that media can accept. And this is where it gets difficult because this is a um, this is actually a visual thing. So you're looking at the print and see you're 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 making a, a judgment on what you see. The spectrometer is not reading it. So once you set those values, then what you do is you print these targets here. So the RIP knows that this J1, the CMYK value that the spectrometer reads should be this. And so you print out this target, and there's different targets. You can print uh, um, uh, like a few targets to a few hundred targets. So the more targets you do, the more the value is going to be on there. So you print these targets, the spectrometer reads it, and it knows that this should have this value, this should have this value, and it does these mathematical equations so that um, when you print other colors, you've matched all these, so you're going to be closer to those. So a profile is all about ink limits and then actually reading colors on there. There's not a lot of rocket science to it, um, but it does make a big difference. The other hard part about profiles and why it's kind of nice to create your, your own profiles is profiles are dependent on humidity, temperature, and your environment too. So if you, uh, if I had an HP Latex 365 printer here in Utah, and then I knew somebody who had one in California at sea level with more humidity, we could have the same, exact same profile, the same rip, the same file, and theirs is going to look a little differently than mine based on their environment. So some shops uh, that have like uh, Vutex and are running seven days a week and have three shifts, those guys are actually profiling, they're tweaking those profiles sometimes every couple of hours on there. Um, but there's, that's kind of one extreme on there. In, uh, in, in a lot of what we do, we call it um, good enough color. So you know how to tweak things and, and get it to work for you. So. It should be called never quite good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to go over a tool on how to the, the easiest way to match color. So when I had my shop years ago, if I printed this file here and my red came out kind of wrong, what I would do is I would come in here and I'd create a box and then I'd manually change the CMYK of these values and I'd spend hours and and print hundreds of boxes. Um, until I got it right. And then it blows me away, some people can look at a print and say, oh, this needs 10% more cyan, and they're really good at it. We have a tool within Flexi um, to help match our Pantone colors, and it doesn't have to be Pantone, it can be any spot color. Um, and what you do is we go to the RIP here, and we go here and we go to Default Job Properties, On the color management tab, under here, under color mapping, if we select this, there are you loaded on there, I'm going to delete them. And we're going to load this file. So, unfortunately, we have to export this as an EPS or a PDF file. Or if you have any file, EPS or PDF, that has spot colors in it, you open them into this tool. And it recognizes my two uh, colors that I have here. So if we go back to the design here, and I go to my color dropper, over here on my fill stroke editor, you can see my color right here. And see how it has that dot in it? That's a spot color. And then this is the name of that. Oops. I did my blue as well. So it's important that they're spot colors. And then in Illustrator, Corel Draw, all those programs, if you were to create a new color, in Flexi, it's this tab right here. Oops, wrong one. The one next to it. 
we can actually create a spot color. So um, we can create all sorts of different colors. We can create RGB, CMYK, LAB, um, different colors in here. So we want to make sure it's a spot color. Um, and then the name is what's important here. So we can name it whatever. We could name this regional red, Coke red, Pepsi blue, whatever we wanted to on there. You can do the same in Illustrator and Corel Draw. And then back here, once we have these colors in here, if I double click on it, it brings up this dialog box right here. So if we printed this and my red was a little bit off, we come in here and we can tweak this. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit print swatch and uh, we pick a font. I don't know why we do that. It should have just the default swatch. But what it does is it creates this really cool chart. Oops. I was too slow. Sorry about that. So this is my chart. So then it prints this chart right here. So this chart is 64 different swatches of that same color. And that color is 4-4. Four, four. The original color is right in the middle there. So then what you do is you take out your Pantone book and you're going to match it or the swatch that your customer brought into you or whatever. And you're going to uh, evaluate this and find out which is the best match on there. So if we find out it's like 6-1, then what we do is we come back here. Under that red, and we put in 6-1, and then it's going to change our CMYK values here. So if we hit update color, we could then call this whatever we wanted to. So if this was, if we were matching for regional, we could call this regional red. And then we hit update color. It saves it in our library, library within the red. So if we renamed it and called it regional red, we would then have to create a custom spot color named exactly regional red on there. And it has to have the same capitals and everything on there because it recognizes that name. So if we hit update color on here, you'll see the CMYK values change to match what was actually printed on there. So this is the easiest way to match colors. Unfortunately, it's only set to, um, to solid colors on there. So if we had a gradient or, um, or if it was in a, a raster file, then it, this doesn't work as well. So then, with those images, we're relying on that our profile was created correctly on there. So when we get into raster images, does that make sense with spot colors? It's kind of confusing. It took me like six times of actually going through the process to really kind of figure it out. And if you go to um, our knowledge base, and just type in spot color mapping. It will walk you through that process on there. And it goes through everything. It, it does a really good job there. So now the other part, I, the, using this tool, it makes it really easy to match solid colors. So the, the other hard part then comes to raster images and uh, things like that. So some other things that are going to help us there under our default properties. This is where we pick our profile. Um, so setting up our color space and then picking the correct profile are like the most important things that you can do. Like I said, that profile, if you're printing on gloss and you pick a matte profile, you're going to put too much ink down, your colors are going to be off. Um, so, so that's important. So picking the right profile to match what you have. Um, with HPs, 
you download the profile on the printer and it loads it into Flexi. In Muto, you can get profiles from Muto. We have them on our website as well. Um, so you're going to download those and put those in there. Um, but this advanced tab, we're going to go back to this here. So we went over input profile, and that's trying to match what the original person designing the file. Um, we're matching that color space so that we're seeing the same thing there. Rendering intents make a huge difference in how we print. And uh, these, these, these are mathematical equations that say, hey, I've got this color out of gamut. How do I print that? So there are different mathematical equations on here. I actually printed out the definitions here. So there's a couple different ones. If we open this up, you've got perceptual, relative color metric, saturation, absolute color metric, no color correction, and black point compensation. No color correction means that, like, um, if you had a CMYK value color, it's going to, it, it's, it's just basically going to print that, those values with no color correction. It's going to print 80% cyan, 79% magenta, whatever that value is. Perceptual is the best rendering intent for raster images, photographs, and things like that. Because what perceptual does is it takes, um, uh, if, if there's a color out of color gamut, it adjusts all the colors the same, regardless if that color is in gamut or not. So if there's a color out of gamut, and there's five colors in gamut, whatever it adjusts that color out of gamut, say it adjusts it 5%. It adjusts the colors that are in gamut 5% too, so it, it adjusts the overall picture. So that's good for pictures. And then on vector graphics, you want to use uh, relative color metric. So relative color metric, so say we have um, a file that has five colors in gamut and two colors out of gamut. It'll take those two colors out of gamut and adjust them to the closest value of that color that's in gamut. And it leaves those five other colors alone. It doesn't mess with those at all. So as far as vector, text, and gradients, logos, and things like that, relative color metric um, is, is your best option for those. Absolute color metric, it's, the, it's similar to relative color metric, um, but it uses a different white point. Um, and this one gets kind of confusing. Um, relative color metric assumes that your white is one white, but um, there's different whites. Does anybody here use Orcal vinyl? Have you noticed that it has a blue hue to it? And then if you hold it up to Avery, like if you, if you held Orcal vinyl, Avery, and 3M, you'll actually see three different shades of white on there. So absolute color metric um, uses a different white Point. Um, so um, that one's always hard to me to explain. So the definition uh, the intent is similar to relative color metric, but it has a different white point value. Absolute color metric represents colors relative to a fixed white point of a different value. And for example, the white point of paper A will be simulated when printed on paper B. This intent is best for color proofing. Trying to think of how best to explain that. Because I don't think you, you can't set the white point. Um, but you, you don't want to use the, any of the other ones you don't want to use. You always set uh, bitmaps to perceptual, vector, text, and gradients to relative color metric on there. Um, and then saturation, um, just really, like if you have uh, a logo or something that you really want to pop and be vibrant, you could set your vectors to
to saturation. Um, and uh, those just, uh, they really, they, they pump a lot of color in there and give you really vibrant colors. Um, we added in Flexi 21 these options over here called Pure Hue, um, which help when we're printing solid colors on here. I usually don't mess with any of the colors on here, but I will come in and set my black and my gray to pure hue. And what those do is um, when you start working with light cyan and light magenta, those get, uh, when, when, we, when we convert colors to CMYK, those light cyans and light magentas get put into your blacks and grays, and sometimes it makes them look kind of um, magenta ish or cyan ish. So if you come in here to uh, and set these to black and gray, you're going to get more true blacks and grays out of there. Another option that we have in here, that this one, um, I don't see this one as much, but have you ever, has anybody ever tried to print like a yellow? And uh, if you get close to it, if you're away from it, like two feet, it looks fine. But if you get up like really close to it, you see dots of magenta or cyan in there. If you select this clean color, it will actually take out those kind of errant cyan magenta dots in there. So it gives you more of a clean cutter color. It's not, it's not muddied by those stray kind of dots on there. Why would you want those dots? Well, so it's, so it's actually adding those colors to get that true value of those colors, but sometimes it's it's not enough to that you would physically actually see a difference on there. So it looks like it's putting such a little amount in it that it looks like little speckles in there. So at that point, just keep them out is yeah. a better option. Yeah, and it's really for people who are looking at things like this close yeah. to graphics and really being nitpicky on there. Because I don't know if you've... Is it, have you ever seen a billboard printed before? Like the dots are seriously like that big on it. Like if you're close to it, it looks horrible, but when it's 50 feet up in the air, it looks really, really good on there. So those are all kind of some things that can help get good color on there. Um, it's your input profiles, your rendering intents, all these um, make it a big difference. I would uh, I would suggest that you go back and take an image and just print some of these at different settings and see what happens on there. You know, take that same image with the same profile and uh, change your CMYK value here to um, like um, this U.S. coded swap and just see the difference on there. But as far as recommended settings, these are kind of your recommended settings on there. Um, and then for your rendering intents, perceptual, relative color metric on, on these here. So those will help kind of set the basis for everything on there. Some other things that we can do within Flexi. There's a couple different things. Some I like and some I'm not, uh, I wouldn't recommend using. I would make changes in other ways. So if we add a job here. So this file right here, um, we can change these colors as well on here. Um, if we go, there's two tabs that we can do it. We've got a color adjustment tab. I don't, uh, some people like this, I, I would rather make the changes in the design. And the reason I say that is uh, if you ever wanted to reprint this, but you made changes in here, it, it doesn't save the changes in the original file. If you go back to Flexi or Illustrator and make the changes there, it's saved in the file. But here, this tab right here, you can click on this button, 
and we can change um, values here. Um, so we can actually come in here and add more green, more yellow, more red. So this is our original image, and this is our current setting. So if I click on the add more red, you can see the change it makes there. Um, and then you can see the original here. So you can make changes here, and then you can change brightness, you can change brightness, contrast, and vividness. Um, so you've got that option. Like I said, I, I, I would prefer to make changes in the original artwork itself. The other thing that you can do is some people are really good at this, but you we've got this eyedropper tool here, and this will work on raster images as well. So if I select my red here, I can double click on this then, and I can actually change my CMYK values here to whatever I wanted. So if I knew that I printed this and that it needed more magenta in there, I could come in here and bump this up to 100% if I wanted to. And it's going to print that. So there's that option as well. The other thing I forgot to mention, but when we were talking about spot color mapping, and this is very important for you guys printing traffic, um, if we design something with spot colors in here, um, when we go to hit print, we have to do a couple things here. Under the color management tab, right here we have to make sure that we have selected use printer spot colors. So and then if I click on mapping, We actually want these to say process on here. They should have defaulted it. That was kind of odd. But uh, but yeah, we want to map those to process color on there. And then when we go from here, when we send this drops it into production manager here. We've got to make sure that that use color mapping is set on there as well. And it maps it to those specific values there. So if we, uh, so if we have Pantone colors, it's pulling from those Pantone libraries we have in the RIP to these predefined values on there. So in the traffic world, um, for printing those traffic colors, the biggest thing is making sure you use those color palettes in Flexi, and then making sure that color mapping is set in here, and then you guys also have presets in there. Do you know what I'm talking about, those presets? So imagine that preset to 3930 or 4000 or whatever. Yeah, for whatever subject you're using. You gotta make sure the printer and that matches the flower and then it'll reinforce it as it was. Yes, correct. <laughs> so some, some other things we can do uh, with uh, color management here. is within Flexi. We could design with that uh, Pantone color palette. That's going to help. Those are all spot colors on there. But we can also create our own color palettes as well. So um, when I had my sign shop, um, I found that the less options I gave my customers, the easier it was. So if you're designing for your, color, your clients and stuff, and you want to print your own color libraries, you can create those within Flexi as well. So this color palette right here, if I wanted to uh, um, print this out, I can come in here um, under uh, edit or view and create swatch. So if I go down here and then come to current palette, on design central here, 
I can pick which color palette I've got loaded. So that Orcal 651, I can select that. I can select what size boxes I want. So if I wanted two inch boxes here, and then uh, change my spacing on here. And then under advanced, it gives you more options. You could actually come in here and turn off. So if we did want to print transparent and white, I can turn those off. And then my label, I can pick whatever font I want on here, whatever size I want. If I wanted these, we'll leave this at an eighth of an inch and hit OK. nice thing about doing this then is that if you, uh, you, you can create your own color palette or you could use one, but if you print this color palette and have it on the wall, um, and then when you're designing, if you use this color palette, you know that um, if I use, design using this uh, sky blue or whatever here, it's going to come out that same color when I print it. So this can make, this can make color matching easy too if you have a predefined color palette that you printed and you're using that to make your designs on there. So that can be helpful as well. Is nobody has a spectrometer. There's a way um, there's a way in Flexi 2 um, where you can actually optimize your paint tone colors. Um, but you have to have a spectrometer for that. Does it link directly in, or do you have to input the information from the spectrometer? Yeah, it, it links in. So you, you attach it to your computer, and then it, it, it puts those values in there. So when you make those readings, it goes into the RIP and puts those values into there. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's a lot of, uh, it, that, that's, information about color management. Is that kind of helpful? Does some of that stuff make sense on there? Yeah. I think that spot color mapping tool is super helpful. I, I use that one quite a bit. Outside from creating your own profiles, if you understand workspaces, use that embedded profile in that, that's going to help quite a bit on there. Um, sometimes when you print and you're getting results that don't look right, go in and change those rendering intents, and uh, that makes a big difference a lot of times on there. So those tools could be uh, really helpful. Do you guys have any questions on color management? So the other next thing we're going to do is we can jump in there. Not only on management, but we do have the thing that I was wondering when you are saying the splots and the yellow. Uh, once in a while when we print uh, black, we'll have a light yellow, like shadow on it. Anybody have any information on that? That would what that what that would be? It's just straight black. No matter what setting we put it on, if it's just black on like a high intensity or whatever, we still have a small little yellow outline. Oh, an outline around. Like it's like it? yeah, around the black. Like you can just barely see it. There's a little bit of yellow. Would that be the amount of yellow that could be an overspring or something? Or that would probably be a head alignment issue. That's what I was wondering. Too. So the yellow's probably a little bit offset on there. On the HPs, I believe the head alignment is something that you can do because those heads are yeah, replaceable. Yeah, we have, yeah, and we have done them a couple times every time we replace them, so it's just interesting that it's, and it's not always consistent, is it? Well, it, it is. Like, it, it has been for this new printer. We just got it, like, a couple months back. Uh, so, so, um, I, well, I, the heads up, so. Yeah, I used to be a latex tech years ago. Yeah. Um, and I always would do the manual head alignment because there's a head alignment where the printer does everything for you and it reads it. That's true. The manual one I think is more accurate right, on there, so you can try that, and then you can really kind of tweak it in. 
Sometimes I don't really trust the, the eye on the printer itself there. Yeah, yeah, we use so many reflectives and stuff too if we're not like, uh, do, like doing all our testing on an IJ-180 or something. Yeah, yeah. So that's accurate anyways. Right, I was going to say you, you'd want to do it on IJ-180 instead of reflective because that'll throw all your measurements off as well. Even some of our non-reflective seem to be a little sometimes shiny if they're mad and I was wondering if that was lasers at all. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we can uh, we can go over print cut and proof cuts on here. So I'll bring in the file. Everything is the easiest part in Flexi. So all you're going to do is you're going to have an image. We're going to select it. Go to Effects, Contour Cut. Um, so the first one we're just going to do a contour cut. We'll put it a quarter of an inch away. We're going to apply that. And then we're going to put a perf cut on it. So we do the same thing. We go to Effects, Contour Cut. And we're just going to put a rectangle around it. The only difference here is we're going to change this to perf contour cut. Or perf cut contour. And then select that. So I'm going to move it away from my artboard just so it's a little easier to see here. So we've got our two different cut lines. So from here, we're going to send it over uh, to Production Manager. And Flexi kind of does everything for you. And I'll say yeah, I'll also show you how to set up presets as well, which can be helpful. Um, we've got our profile and everything, but we're going to go to the cut tab. And I can tell right away that I might have accidentally selected both lines as perf cut there, because I would have seen my other one here. So I'm going to go back here. Try this again. So, X contour cut. We're gonna go to contour. Does Flexi let you change that <laughs> contour cut line, like where that R and the L kind of stick out, and it's got that bump out in the contour cut? Yeah. Can that be straightened? Yeah, you could. Flexi? So, yeah, that that's a good question. So, we're gonna make sure that that was on cut contour. And we apply that. What you could do if you wanted to here is you could, uh, it groups everything with that. So if we right click and go to uh, separate contour cut. And there might be one more step we'll see here. I think you have to go to effects. Um, Sometimes you have to convert it to outlines, but if we go to our tools here, we come in here and select those two points and straighten that out over there. What's the tool that you're using called? These are my, um, my vectorization cleanup tools. And it's just that all of them do something different, so I, we just pick that straight line one there. If we wanted to do a curve, we could select one of those. So now we'll go in here and we'll put our proof contour cut. So now when we come into here and uh, we come over to this tab, we, you can see that we've got our two different lines here. And there's going to be two different workflows. So um, I think, does anybody have a, a latex cutter? Yeah, I think you, okay. And then some other people had a graph tech, correct? And then somebody said a roll-on cutter. So we'll, we'll go through graph tech in here and then maybe we can jump in with the roll-on here. 
Um, but with the latex cutter, it's uh, a little different workflow. So right here is where we tell it what cutter we're going to use. I had two cutters on here, um, so you can select those. But if we come in here, our registration marks are right here. Um, so we can, it defaults to the HP barcode. And then if you select options in here, you can come in here and make some changes. So if we, we'll put a couple of different copies in here. So when you're doing multiple copies, one thing that I like to do is uh, I always leave it right justified while I do my copies. And then once I put in all my copies, so if I needed 16 copies here, I don't like to print right justified because I always get worried that my marks are going to be too close to the edge. So once I put in my copies, then I'll come in and center everything. Um, sometimes my copies don't work as well if I center it first and then put in my copies. But that's uh, what I usually do. And then as far as our options here, so with the HP, there's different options. The Opus XY2 is kind of default on there. Opus Extra will put extra marks around the edge here, and what it'll do is it'll read it'll read those four marks and then cut, and then it'll go to the next four marks and cut on there. So this gives you a little extra um, reliability tracking on there, which is kind of a cool feature. It takes longer, but it gives you more accurate. So you could possibly set like a 20 foot long thing of decals, and it's just going to keep reading those. Um, and then you've got options for your barcode. Um, you can set your space between the barcode and the job. A lot of people will ask how to change this. So if you wanted a half inch space in there, it puts a half inch between that barcode and, and the job. And this is where it gets a little tricky with the HP. Um, so we've got our contour cut. And we could change the order of these if we wanted to. So if we wanted the cut contour first and then the perf cut, all we do is select it and move it up or down. But if I double click on this here, um, HP has some, some presets here. It's default kiss cut. If I go to, if I change this to uh, default kiss cut, it's going to use whatever parameters you set on the cutter. If you go to self adhesive vinyl kiss cut, it gives you the ability to change your tool, your pressure, and your speed on here. So anything that you check is going to override what's set on the cutter. It's easy on the kiss cut, and HP gave us all the parameters for this, and they changed it, made it a little more complicated. On the, on the perf cut, what you actually have to do is you have to select cut through. Um, and then, where is it? It's there, right there. So you have to change the perf cut to cut through, like I said there. And then you have to click on job options. And then you have to change it to, if you select default cut through, it defaults it to the perf cut on the cutter. Or if you go self adhesive final cut through, then you can make changes here. And I don't know the preset settings here, but full pressure is full pressure all the way down through the vinyl and the backing. Full pressure length is the length of that cut. And then flex pressure, that knife actually comes up and creates that little tab so it doesn't cut the backing until it plunges again. So you can change all those settings here. So that's the HP. You guys with the HP, does that make sense on the perf cuts there? Mm -hmm. How long has it been that you had to go into job options to select cut through again? Like, has uh, that always been a thing? No. So it used to be, um, so when I double click on here and change this to, to this, the, the perf cut, you used to be able to do it that same way. Okay. In 22, HP made us change it for whatever reason, which drives me crazy. I get yelled at all the time for this. So you double click on it here, you have to change it to cut through, and then 
you have to change it in job options. Okay. Make sense? Yep, thanks. So then, same thing on a graph tech. This time, we're changing it to a graph tech cutter. You can come in here, you've got the different graph tech uh, options on here. Most people use the graph tech four point. Um, and then you've got options on here as well. Has any, have any of you guys used the barcode function on the graph tech? I believe, it, do you guys have a 9,000 or is it an 8,600? 8,600. Okay. So the, I, I think it's the 9,000 that has the barcode. The, the barcode's pretty cool. Um, what it does is it prints a barcode. And on the HP, what it does, the HP prints a barcode. The cutter will read the barcode and then it reaches to Flexi, finds the cut job, and will automatically start cutting it. So you don't have to go back to Flexi and send the cut job. So it's a pretty cool workflow. But we'll turn it off here. So with the graph tech, um, all you do is double click on there, and then you can uh, change your 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 options here. Now, this drives me a little bit crazy here, but the speed 50 is pretty fast on that graph tech. So you want to come in here and change this. Anything that has a check on it will override what's on the graph tech. My personal workflow that I like with the graph tech is I set up condition one to my kiss cut. So I'll have like condition one for cast kiss cut, condition two for calendar kiss cut, and then I'll usually set up condition eight with my perf cut settings on there. So then what I'll do is I'll set my kiss cut to condition one, and then my perf cut I'll just come in here and set that to my condition eight for my perf cut. And then on the graph tech, when you set up those conditions, you set up your, your perf cut conditions on there. I think there's different patterns and whatnot on there. And then hit OK, and it's all kind of set up on there. Does that make sense? So from here, and this, this part gets a little confusing too, I think. This is kind of an intermediary between Flexi and Production Manager. So when I hit Send here, um, one thing I always do is I make sure this is set to Hold and List so it doesn't cut automatically. I hit Send. And then uh, my Production Manager has got my print job here, and then my cut job should be under my graph tag there. So with that graph tag then, once it's printed, you're gonna put it in the cutter, you're gonna line up your cutter in that first little mark, and then you're gonna come in here and hit send from here. And then there are a couple options on here. There's a pause in between. Um, one thing that I do see occasionally is sometimes people set up their cut contour and their perf cut, but it will kiss cut everything and kind of ignore your perf cut. And uh, sometimes this will get checked right here. So if you have this selected where it says use same driver option for all colors, even though we have the two conditions here, it's going to use kiss cut for everything. So if you ever, if it doesn't perf cut, double check on that there. So that's kind of print and cut workflow. Um, are there any questions on that? No? All right. That went kind of quick to me after <coughs> noon. Does anybody have any questions kind of above and beyond anything that we went over there? Could I use this software rather than the Fiery software that I use for my other printer? Um, that's a good question. It's a Xerox, right? Yeah, Xerox Prime Link. Do any of those models look familiar? No? No. I was just wondering. Fiery's a pretty high end um, of rip. But Flexi's rear, our, our kind of market segment is print and cut and uh, um, smaller sign shops when you get up into Vutex and 
people who have like five or six printers, then um, that's uh, sometimes where um, like Onyx or some of those rips are a little more powerful on there. Because they have ways to emulate um, color spaces. So you could emulate like your Xerox color space with your HP color space and it kind of, it, it basically maps it to the smaller of the two color gamuts on there. So it just have to be a different software yeah. all together for both of them? Is yeah. That the okay. Thank you. Is that a big printer or is it, is it kind of like a copier type it's printer? It's a production printer. Okay. It's all the fancy colors, like the fluorescence and the metallics. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, another thing that I can show you guys here uh, that I, I kind of like is uh, you, you all probably print on different medias. You can set up different presets for those different medias. So, for example, here on the, um, the HP Latex printer, um, if we right-click on here, and go to default job properties. Um, anything we set right here is going to be a default. If we have a job open, anything that we make a change here is going to be job dependent. So, if we want to set defaults, we go to our default job properties, and we can set anything as a default here. On this first tab, um, there's not really a lot that you're going to set as a default on here, because this is where you're sizing the job and doing different things. Here, um, we're not going to change too much other than our cutter, but this is where you're going to set defaults on here. So. Um, I, I don't have a lot of profiles on here, they're just these generic self-adhesive. So if I set this uh, to my generic self-adhesive here, um, we're going to set our profile here, our resolution, whatever we want to on here. Um, I'm not going to set anything here. Usually elsewhere we're not going to set too many preferences. You may want to, you could set up like a banner preset that's automatically going to put grommets and things on there. So what we do from here, and then is we, if we hit this save button, I usually select all, and then hit uh, save. Uh, we can call this preset whatever we want. And then it's gonna set a, a preset here. And we can create as many presets as we wanted to on here. We could set up a preset for cast vinyl, calendar vinyl, banner vinyl. And then all you have to do, instead of opening a job and then making the switch, what you can do is you can go to job, add job. And if I were to add this job again, I can then come in here and select whatever preset I wanted to on there. Is there a way to do it? So like when you're in Flexi and you go to this print setting thing, um, like it, it's, it's when you're in the Flexi program and you hit print, is it available there? Yes. Yeah, so, so you would select it here and then if you were in Flexi here, when we go to print this, we've got the presets right here. And you guys should have those already set up with that 3M version. It's got those different presets set up in there. Yeah. So it's just a, a way of kind of automating everything on there. Can you run through the Roland setup? For a cut? Yeah. So I don't know if it would be the same. Yeah, we might have to go through it. I, I don't know Roland's very well, but maybe we could probably figure it out here. So we're going to go to set up. I think it was very similar to one of the other ones you did, just with circles instead of squares. With yeah. Illustration marks. Um, similar swap. What model is it? Oh, uh, that's a great question. <coughs> it's like a GDS 40, 25 or something. 
Yeah, that looks good. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty GX24, actually. Yeah, how big is that? This big. Yeah, probably about like, 3, 4 inches. Yeah, I mean, maybe 3. I 30 think it inches. is this GX. Yeah, it's probably the GX. We'll just set up the GX640 here. Okay. Because that kind of matches our printer size. Is there any place that, um, maybe a knowledge base or a place that people might be sharing profiles for printing on unconventional materials and things like that? I mean, most of the time we're printing on something that probably hasn't been printed on before or, or we're kind of trying it. A lot of times we're saying, no, oh, this material's kind of like this, let's use that profile. Yeah, you know what, I've, I've always thought that would be a good thing to have sure. there. Um, we've got our printer profiles here that you can go in and download the, the profiles we've created, but I don't, I don't know of a shared site out there. You can, you can pay people. There's a company here in town called Color Concepts, and that's all they do. They make profiles right. for yeah. companies like HP. The scary thing is, is like, uh, like they usually charge like upwards of fifteen hundred dollars to create a profile for you. Okay. Um, so at that point, you could buy a spectrometer sure. for that much. Sure. Sure. And, uh, and and that there are inexpensive um, spectrometers out there yeah. that work as well. Um, so okay. cool. To, There's some decent Facebook groups too, right. like for your printer brand and jump on. And yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. It's a flexi dark web site. Right. Flexi dark web. <laughs> Some special code. There has to be. There should be. So the workflow is pretty much the same. So you can come in here. They've only got the one marks on there. Um, do you know on that cutter? I think I already asked you, but you could. A lot of these cutters, like if you go into the menu, there's an option to set different perf cut patterns and stuff. Is that available on that? Not that I know of. Okay. No. I'll show you kind of a workaround around that. There. Sure. So. Um, Manually, we can get into it and say we want less or you know more force or something like yeah. that. But yeah, yeah. But usually, when you're doing a perf yeah. cut, there's one force for like the all the way cut through, right. and then there's a little tab that holds it together that's less force, and then you go to more force. But I, there's yeah. kind of another workaround around there. Okay. change the pattern here. So it's a, a dashed line. And you can create your own dashed line too under edit if any of these don't work. But you want to make sure again that you choose a different parameter. So a perf cut contour. And then when we go to send this, you're just going to change your pressure here. So if you double click on this, the only thing that you're really going to change is probably your force to go through both layers on there. And then uh, and then we've set up the perf cut line here. Those other, the graph tech and the HP, they've already got patterns set up for perf cut, so it does it automatically, but you could do it this way too. 
The other thing you want to be careful of is, um, like, it's cutting over that cutting strip, so it's going to ding up that cutting strip. It's going to put gouges in it. Yeah. Yeah. Does that perf supersede the setting in the plotter if it was a graph tick? I, that's a good question. I think what it's going to do is it's going to it's going to use that perf line and then it's going to do the perf pattern inside that perf line. So each one, so it'd probably really kind of mess it up. Get weird. Yeah, yeah. And these are probably spaced too far apart. I mean, you want very little space in between those little notches holding it together. There. Onyx is a great program. They're out there. I mean, we all do the same thing. Um, and then uh, nobody, you, you guys are all printing out of Flexi, correct? Because we do have, we, we sell our design program alone. We have a send to Onyx button, a send to VersaWorks, and, um, and those different ones. So that's kind of, that was everything I've got. We didn't do the white workflow. Nobody's got that. And we started a little early for lunch, so you know, we could open it up. I'm happy to go over more questions if you guys have more questions. Um, on the XP, right? Um, it's brand new for me. And I, let's say that I have a, a vinyl, the glossy, that the glossy that is thick. Uh -huh. And I put the, you know, the settings that it says right there. But it doesn't cut all, no, I don't want it all the way, but you know, like you can peel it easily. Yeah. So right now you have to go like one by one and take it in order to take all the way down. Yeah. And I try to do more pressure, it's not working. And I try to do, you know, like 175, 100, 200, 200, 200 you know, and it doesn't work. So yeah, there, there is a science behind it, behind it. and the gentleman behind you is probably the foremost expert on cutting vinyl. Um, but there's different things, like, um, so your blade holder, that, that blade sticks out a certain amount below it there. You have to you have to set that really be down. Yeah, you don't want it out too much because mm -hmm. that can cause mm -hmm. trouble. So ideally, and you can correct me if I say things wrong here, but ideally you want the blade sticking out the same thickness it's as the vinyl that you're, you're cutting. And a couple things you can tell is that if it's too deep it'll cut into the backing paper. Mm -hmm. And if it's not deep enough then um, even if you put a ton of pressure on it, it's not gonna cut all the way through it. Um, the easiest way to set that blade depth that I use is I take the blade holder out and I take my vinyl and put another piece of vinyl under it and I just use very little force and I cut uh, a pound sign and you want to be able to pick, pick the middle out of there and then you can adjust that blade to do that. So once you get the blade dialed in, then you can adjust your force on there. Yeah, and somebody set it up for me and I didn't touch it. You know, like when it, you have something new, you don't want to screw it up. So right, and then you got to be careful because if you break the tip off the blade, then it's not going to cut as well, too. So that's the big thing. Yes. You, you, you talk about, you, you do the uh, pound cut. Yeah. That's two lines. I do it with three lines because then you can see if it's sticking to the other little pieces. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would assume it's probably that blade depth or you've broken the tip off the blade on there. Okay. Does that one have to cut strip too? Because we've had also like the problem of not being able to cut thoroughly through the cut strip this week or if we need to yeah. switch out your blade and cut strip. But being new, yeah, like the only be for throw that thing. Yeah, that tip. Yeah. That's how it works. yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that happened. I had the, the cameo, you know, when the little one. Sometimes I have to just to touch it to feel a little bit like down there, yep. and then it will yeah. cut. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That can be cut. So that the first one will be automatic. You know, like you just put more pressure and it goes more you know, right. down. Yeah. If you've adjusted your pressure way up, it's probably it's not out enough, or that tip is broken off. So that would be my guess. Okay. And another question: uh, to save more media. Because I don't know if it's that particular, but it doesn't cut like very close to the margins. So it's a lot of wasting, you know, um, material. Even though with a barcode, I change it to a list um, an inch in order to get, you know, like, and sometimes it's like six inches. 
So it's wasting a lot of media. So so how can I what can I do to to help me to save more media? So are you talking about want to touch? Yes, are you talking about like so you print one job with the barcodes and then you're printing another job after it? Let's say that I have the barcode, right? Uh -huh. And I got put many copies. Yeah. Right or many right. repeats, right? As right. you did previously. But since the beginning of the media to the barcode, if you set if you put one uh, inch, it doesn't say one inch, it goes like more always more within paper. Yeah. Even though on the sides and it doesn't go it goes like two or three inches that you wasted, you know, on both sides. Right. Um, let me show you this and then I think there's something in the um, the printer. Do you what what model printer do you have? Is it a three thirty? HP uh three fifteen. Okay. So three. Like yours is like it doesn't have barcode, but it's very close to the to the beginning. Yeah. Okay. So I think it always pushes out a few inches before it starts printing. Mine does too, like this much every uh -huh. time at least. Yeah. So because you know when you start the job, the paper is all the way there, so you think that it's yeah, gonna start no, it fades no, out, like, uh -huh. and then yeah, you have like a foot of waste on every one. So how do you fix it? I don't. Oh, I they say just to account for not in yeah. like the job. A lot of times if I put it closer to the barcode, it won't recognize it on the cut machine. So if there's not a few inches of space before the barcode, it won't cut it. And then it's waste, the whole thing's wasted. Oh. So in my experience, you got to have a couple of inches before the barcode for the cutter. Oh. Same with registration works for us. If you don't give them enough space, then you complicate it when you're trying to scan them. Yeah, or if they're too close buddy together, <laughs> yeah, that's one thing we have on our reflective materials for cutting it. We have to put some a tape or transfer tape over and redo the registration marks. Yeah. If not, the laser will bounce right back off and screw everything up. Yeah. Yeah. What's so, your fix for that? Uh, we take transfer tape or masking tape mm -hmm. or even just a piece of tape you can kind of see through and just draw them back on there and put it on top of it because it's just looking for that little right. corner piece. Cause yeah, you had it set up on here we use the four corners, or if it's a long run, you do the little side ones too. And it's we just have to put a new mark on top of the old mark. Because we'll do stuff too where we have to put laminate over the top of it, and then it has to scan through the laminate into the thing. So if it's reflective or has laminate on it, we always go through and redraw our registration marks. Yeah, so um, yeah, the, so those are good questions too. Um, so when, when cutters read those registration marks, it reads contrast on there. So if there's, if your if your marks aren't dark enough, it won't read that contrast. So sometimes it's putting a, something as simple as a transparent tape over the marks can help reading if your cutter's not or if it's not reading it. Um, but as far as the spacing here with the HP, it defaults to three inches on the leading edge. You can't change that, and I believe. You might have to call the regional tech guys, but I believe there's a setting on the printer itself too that puts a, a margin on there. Um, and I'm trying to think because like, like if you load the media and then back it up to try to print on the leading edge of it, sometimes it does some funky things with that. If you don't set like an origin, it'll feed it back out to where it was on there. But different printers have different media paths, so sometimes if you back it up, it'll get jammed up in there and stuff. But um, check this setting right here. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. um, That's what I change it to one inch. Uh, yeah, because if you change it to one inch, it'll go back to three inches on there. If you go to... We can do this too at the yeah, right there. Right there the barcode. When you go to the barcode, barcode options. Oh, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Right there, right. You can change it there. <laughs> oh, yeah, so the um, barcode space between the barcode. So you change that to one inch. Uh huh. And then it comes down. So you can put it, you can change it now right there. Yep. Instead of 269, you can put one or 
one and a half, whatever. Right, right. That is not helping. Oh, it's not putting that distance between that? No. It still goes like six inches. So that is always. Yeah. So that is only changing the, the distance between like that point and the barcode right there. So, so yeah, you're, you're saying distance like from the leading edge of the media to yes. the barcode. Yeah. So this, um, what you changed here in options only changes the space between the, like the bottom of the job here and the barcode. Because if we have, it's normally defaulted to zero there. So see how the barcode got mm -hmm. it. So it changes that space on there. Correct, and know the paper when they take it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I, I think HP's built that in there so that you, because if, if you don't have enough leading edge on the media, then the cutter thinks it's out of media and it won't read those marks on there. Yeah, that's annoying to know because <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of money over yeah. there. And instead of, hey, like six inches is too much. Maybe three inches, two inches, but. Then you wasting, you know, what is in the, in the when you start, and then on the side. So right. So what? Yeah. Well, yeah. If I reel the reel, the lead in with the tape and everything, yeah, there's a lot of our leads are in between. If you don't buy it quarterly. Yeah, and your media is like fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, so it's, it's not really cheap for the reflective stuff, but yeah, it's hard for us to get anything under maybe 12, 18 inches on lead every time we start. So if we can do long runs, it's usually preferable, and then you can moderate it between each run. Yeah. But yeah, those ones. Just because you have to take them up from one rail to the other rail, and no matter what, when you take those two things up, you have to take a rail that gives you a good foot. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Maybe Flexi 23 can do something about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are actually functions of the printers on those ones. So. Sure they are. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> we'll see. So that's, next. that's the hard thing about, because we, we as a software company always blame the printers, and the printer guys always blame us on it. It's a vicious battle. <laughs> I know on my printer though, if it isn't out far enough, when it yeah. goes to heat, it will bend it up and ruin it anyway. So yeah. you have to have that distance. Right, right. Yeah. 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 There's, yeah. There's, it's hard because it's uh, that is a lot of money. Because if you're you're print, I mean, ideally the best thing is to print a full roll of material. But how often does that happen that you have enough jobs to do that? Oh yeah. I would just, just be able to sit and run it all day without it wanting to throw a fit on you all day. <laughs> Eight hours of heat, especially the stuff we do, like get the heat effects after a little while. Yeah, right. Or us, one or the other. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Those are good questions. No? Um, I kind of wanted to make a comment about the dark web. For <laughs> um, so I no. uh, so like I use Reddit. It actually has like communities. So I use the printer community and like the sign shop community. And like if I have various questions about printers that nobody can answer and I can't find online, then they just essentially like you can post it in each community and you get different answers depending on like who's in what community. Yeah. Um, I would definitely. Yeah, there's Signs 101 too. That's a, a, a board out there that's really good. I uh, when I was doing tech support, I would go on there all the time and just type in something and find it. And there'd usually be threads of people who've had that problem. That's a good one. You have to sign up for it, but uh, it, it doesn't cost anything. No, it's a good one. I mean, like if you're if you just follow the guidelines in every community, then it should be fine. Like. But you might get kicked out of the community if you're like <laughs> posting something that's not applicable or you're not following like the comment on the left. Yeah. That it should be. Okay. I wouldn't last long. <laughs> what? I wouldn't last very long. <laughs> I'm going to start my own. Camera. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, you know, another thing, this is a paid site. Um, it, it's actually our site. We're making some changes to it right now. That's a good plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It, 
the concept behind it I think was very good, but I don't think it, um, oops. It's called a dindo.com. In, uh, in what we do and what regional does, like tech support for printers, there's a difference between tech support and training. Tech support is something broken and it needs to be fixed and training is, um, I don't understand how to do this, how do I do it? And those, sometimes those lines get blurred on there a little bit. So we created this uh, site, Addendo, um, and we do training on Onyx, uh, Flexi, Illustrator, Photoshop, um, printers and different things. So you can uh, connect on here with um, like a trainer and you pay, it, it's paid training. So you can find an expert in Flexi with HP and this and that. This is a good site to go to. We had separated it from our company, but we hired a gentleman named Mark Rugen, who has been training on Flexi for like 25 years and knows inside and out. He worked for Muto for the last couple of years, and we are we're putting a lot of money into training and different things this year. So you're, um, if you uh, keep if you go to our website, thinksai.com, I think you'll, you're going to start seeing more and more. Training. We do a webinar once a month on different topics, um, but, but I think we're going to start doing a lot more, and those are free out there. So that's uh, good to keep track of. In fact, uh, our biggest training with this addendo is for the traffic guys, those guys, and we go into those shops all the time and help out with that. And then, like I said, our YouTube site, and if you turn on the cloud page, and go to this uh, knowledge base right here. This knowledge base is really good. You can usually find answers to questions there, but it's it's specific to the software. So, any more questions while you guys got me here? I hope you found it helpful and learned something from what I rambled on about here today. Um, like I the design side of it, there's lots of stuff in there. Some of those tools are really helpful. Variable data, auto serialization, cut order, um, color palettes, different things like that, smart objects. Color management um, is pretty tricky. That spot color mapping tool is really helpful. Um, and then knowing your workspaces is pretty important and using those embedded profiles. And then like I said, if you get a chance, um, I know you guys are all probably busy, but Take one file and change those rendering intents and those input profiles and just see what what happens on there. You guys with the traffic, we those are all locked and stuff based on 3M and HP. They spent years doing durability testing and stuff on that. So there's not much tweaking that you guys can do there, but oh, yeah, we don't want to mess with the heat all the time and sometimes we have to do we can. No. <laughs> <laughs> you have to like rebuild the profile just yeah, like yeah. Phone profile, but then with the traffic stuff, if it's not uh, the right transparency, no matter what color, it won't become red warranty and they can reject it. Yeah, so and we just uh, we just released a new update actually on Monday to the 3M traffic version. So if you go in there and uh, re-download that, there's a uh, some of the profiles have been tweaked. Like you won't be able to. They're not physically visible by the naked eye, the color on there, but I'm sure it has to do with the reflecticity of those colors oh, yeah. and some other things. I'm sure the, the actual chemistry is how they do it. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, they just barely set up one of the emails saying what colors for what printers are acceptable and not acceptable anymore. I don't know if it's be a but one of them let us know that some things aren't compatible with the yellows you can't print anymore and stuff like that. Right. You can still print them, they're just not covered under that. Covered warranty. warranty. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're all about the warranty, the 3M warranty. We do everything for the MYs and the Flexi, so we have to try to accommodate for multiple warranties. Yeah. So. Well, thank you everybody for your time. I appreciate you guys coming in here. Like I said, I hope that was helpful and you take some away.